Welcome to Algebra 3. I hope all of you are doing well. Of course, I'd rather be doing this live in a classroom with all of us together. But we will make the best of the situation that is given to us. I still hope that this will be a good learning experience for you. So let's start. Uh, before we jump in, I would like to make two points. The first is about the textbook and also the supplementary material that I have given you like this one and the relationship between that and the lectures and I hope that the two will be complementary to each other. Artin is of course a great textbook. He explains everything properly and the other material that I have sent you, uh, all of those also have their positive points. Uh, for every lecture, I will tell you what I'm going to cover. So this is the relevant material for today. Uh, in addition, I will more or less follow the sequence of topics as in Artin. So we will cover chapters 11, 12 and 15 in that order, most of the material. And this forms the core material in the course. We'll cover this in about seven to eight weeks. I'll be doing roughly one section per day. So. What I'm saying is that you can follow the entire course based on just the textbook and the other material as you wish. So I hope that uh, you started reading this material. If you have not, I strongly recommend that you do. Uh, so that's the textbook part. And uh, so if that is going to be enough, then really what is the point of lectures? One answer is that I want to give you my perspective. Uh, so sometimes there may be a change of emphasis, sometimes I might do a little more material, etc. Um, uh, but I also want to say that in class 2 we will have self-contained development. So if you wish, you can follow just the lectures. Uh, but what will work out the best for you is if you follow the book uh, as well as follow the lectures. Uh, that will help you develop your own perspective and so uh, you know the kind of understanding that you build on your own that's the best kind of understanding. My second point is about a distinct advantage of recorded lectures and this is important. Uh, as non-ideal as this method is it does give you one power which is to pause the lecture whenever you would like and also to go back and forth as much as you want. This is a big deal. Okay. And I'm going to be using this consciously in every single lecture. So at times I will ask you to pause and work something out. So this could be um, some calculation. It could be some other detail like working out an example or maybe solving a small problem. Or I could ask you to repeat a reasoning in a new context, uh, which is similar to something that we have done before. Uh, any number of things. So when I ask you to pause and do something, please stop immediately and do the assigned work immediately there and then. Okay. So this will take some time, um, but not really very much, maybe just a few minutes and it will bring a lot of advantages to you. So uh, one is that it will actually save time in the long run uh, because you see, you see me work things out over here and, and it does you no good. If instead you do this on your own, then naturally without making any extra effort, you will build understanding of definitions, examples, standard tools and standard reasoning that will repeat again and again. Uh, so uh, all of this uh, will happen only with, uh, uh, only if you try to learn actively. So this is an easy way in which you can just build understanding naturally in your mind and knowledge will take root in your mind and grow without really any extra effort. So please take this seriously. And now let's uh, get to actual stuff. So before defining rings, let's try to see what they're good for. And until now you have seen two kinds of algebraic structures in your previous two algebra courses. So groups provide us a language to study symmetry, which is a fundamental notion in mathematics. And vector spaces give us a language to study linearity, which is a ubiquitous phenomenon in all of mathematics and also in applications in sciences, engineering, etc. The motivation to study rings is 
a little more diffuse because they occur in a number of different situations. For us, uh, the relevant settings are number theory and to some extent algebraic geometry. I'd also like to say that rings provide us a way to give a major generalization of linear algebra. And uh, we will take a few steps in this direction. Um, at this point, uh, it is possible uh, to provide examples of problems in these areas for which number theoretic input is a major part of solving them. Uh, but before I do that, it would be useful to define a ring. So this is the first time that, that I'm going to ask you to stop, like I said before. Uh, so please write down a correct and complete definition of a ring. And like I asked you in problem two of homework zero, please write down as many examples as you can of rings and uh, also categorize them uh, in whatever fashion you can. So please do it right now. So informally, we know that a ring is a place where you can add, subtract and multiply. Uh, but it's important to know the formal definition. So here it is. So a ring is first of all a set and you have two binary operations defined on it. So this is one that we call addition and multiplication uh, in such a way that uh, R under the operation plus is an abelian group with the neutral element zero. So what that means is that addition is associative, addition is commutative, and every element has an additive inverse. So the additive inverse of A is always denoted by minus A as usual. Then moving on, R under the operation dot, which we will always call multiplication, is a monoid. That means that there is a multiplicative identity one and the multiplication is associative. And that's it. We do not insist that the multiplication be commutative for the general definition of a ring. Uh, notice that until now, the operations of addition and multiplication, they do not talk to each other. Uh, but we do want them to do that. Uh, we do want them to be compatible. And so this is the all important distributive law. So which means that multiplication distributes over addition uh, in both orders. So, and another way in which we want, uh, this may look like nitpicking and it is in a way. Another way in which we want addition and multiplication to talk to each other is that we do want the elements 0 and 1 to be distinct from each other. And we'll say why in just a bit. So a couple of things to note. Notice that the way I have written things over here, I have put parentheses around the first multiplication and the second multiplication. But in practice, we will never do that. We will just write AB plus AC without the parentheses. And notice that I said AB because most often, we will simply delete the dot in a dot b and simply write a b. Okay. Um, okay. So this is as far as the definition is concerned. So at this point, what we can do is we can uh, do some natural development. We can prove some basic properties, introduce some more words, and we will get to it. But before that, we must write down examples. So that's our next task. Okay, so here we have some examples of rings. And in all cases, I have actually given you just a set. Uh, but in every case, there is a standard operation of addition and one of multiplication. Uh, so using these, you can and you actually should check that I have a ring in every single case. So pause as needed. The check is mostly straightforward. Okay, so let's see them one by one. The very first example is the ring of integers. Uh, this is in some ways the most important ring, certainly for number theory. And that's why we had a focus on this in the first homework that you did, homework zero. And I hope that all the things that uh, were on that homework, you are very comfortable with them because they will come up again and again. We will need to use them. Moving on. Next, I have rational numbers, real numbers and complex numbers. Again, very familiar settings. 
And in all of these, you see that every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. So I can divide here. So by definition, all of these are fields. Okay. Uh, notice that I did not say multiplicative. I said just an inverse. So we will, whenever we talk about inverses, it will always mean multiplicative inverse. Uh, because under addition, anyway, every element has its additive inverse, which we just call its minus. So inverses will always mean multiplicative inverses for us. Okay, moving on. The next example is the ring of Gaussian integers. So this is a subset of complex numbers in which both the real and imaginary part are integers. So you should check that this is a ring. It's, it's an interesting ring that we will see once again just in a short while. And it is going to help us solve a very interesting problem. Uh, moving on, I have the next example, which is different from the ones before in the sense that all of these examples were subsets of complex numbers. Now I have something which is obtained as a quotient. So Z mod NZ, the set of integers modulo N. You have already seen this as an abelian group where the elements are congruence classes modulo N for some positive integer N. Um, so what is being asked, uh, what is being asserted here and you should check this that in this world, I also have a well-defined multiplication, okay? So uh, this is going to require a little bit of work because you have to check that the multiplication is independent of the representative chosen for a congruence class. So this should remind you of work that you did in checking that the quotient construction in the group theory case actually does give you a group. And the natural setting for doing something like this for rings is Again, a quotient construction, which we will see shortly. But here you should check by hand that I do get a ring over here when n is an integer greater than 1. Okay. Um, a second thing that I would like you to check right now, please pause and check right now, is uh, in fact a problem. For which values of n is z mod nz a field? In other words, when does it happen in such a world that every non-zero integer mod n has a multiplicative inverse? So please do that right now. Okay, so what you should have found out was that z mod nz is a field precisely when n is a prime number. Okay, and a sort of uh, clean way of seeing this is to realize the following. Uh, suppose I have an integer a that is not divisible by p. So in this case, the GCD of a and p is 1. Therefore, I can write 1 is equal to x a plus y p for suitable integers x and y, which I can find using the Euclidean algorithm. So now if I take this equation and interpret it modulo p, what I have obtained is the congruence class of x times the congruence class of a is the congruence class of 1. In other words, I have located the multiplicative inverse of uh, a modulo p. Okay? And you can run this argument backwards. So the reason to do this is uh, to show you that what we did on homework 0 is going to be important. And I expect you to be able to carry out this kind of reasoning really without too much thought. Okay, It should come fairly easily. All right. Uh, just a little uh, note here. You may have seen uh, the ring of uh, you, you may have seen integers modulo n represented using this notation z and a subscript n. Please do not use this notation because in ring theory, this notation, especially when n is a prime number, is used for denoting a completely different ring, an important ring of uh, p periodic integers. And perhaps we will have a chance to see this sometime. But please do not use this notation to denote z mod nz. Okay. Moving on, I have polynomials. So here I have taken polynomials in one variable x whose coefficients are real numbers. Uh, I can generalize both of these. So instead of real numbers, I can take uh, rational numbers or complex numbers or even integers. And all of these are going to be very important examples for us. We can also generalize by taking instead of one variable x, we can take multiple variables. 
and such rings are very important. Uh, they are at the very foundation of algebraic geometry, especially with coefficients taken from complex numbers. So we will have something to say about this later on. All right. So having seen these examples, uh, there are a couple of things worth remarking. One is that notice that all of these rings have the property that when I multiply things, the order does not matter. So I have AB equals BA, right? So such rings are called commutative rings. And for us, uh, most of the rings that we will be interested in will be commutative. So therefore, we make this convention that unless I specify otherwise, whenever I say ring, it will mean a commutative ring. Okay, so please keep this in mind. I will try to say commutative ring explicitly as much as possible, but unless I specifically say that the ring could be non-commutative, I always mean a commutative ring. Okay, so I have to hasten to add at this point a very important exception, and that is the case of square matrices of a fixed size, for example, with real entries. So you should check that these also form a ring. And as is well known, multiplication of matrices is non-commutative. In fact, almost always two matrices will not commute with each other. So this is a very important example of non-commutative rings that we will come to and study at some length um, down the line. But for now, most important rings for us are going to be rings like this, which are all commutative rings. Okay. Uh, so the next point to note is the following. What do I mean by rings like this? Okay. Uh, if you start with Z, which was our initial ring, notice that many other rings here are formed by some kind of procedure. Okay. So let's see one by one. Rational numbers are from, formed from integers from some kind of procedure. You can also say that real numbers and complex numbers come out of some kind of procedure. Um, an infinite process is required over there, but still some kind of procedure. This interesting example, you can think of this as uh, a solution to a particular desire. Namely, I want to have integers and I also want to have square root of minus one. So what is the smallest world in which I uh, get to have both of these things and still have a ring? Okay. So just notice that if instead of square root of minus one, uh, if I replace this i by square root of any integer, let's say square root of uh, some integer d. So I take everything of the type a plus b times square root of d. Then uh, such numbers also will form a ring. However, if instead of square root of d, let's say I take square root of, uh, let's say I take cube root of 3. And if I take uh, cube root of 3 and uh, try to do the same construction, then I do not get a ring. So uh, you can think about what a solution to this problem would be. Namely, I want to construct uh, a world in which I have integers. I also have the cube root of three. And I want this world to form a ring and be as small as possible. Okay. So later on, we will see many examples of uh, constructions of this kind and they will be important for us. All right, so moving on. Uh, here I have a different, quite a different kind of construction, again starting from Z, so the quotient construction. And polynomials also have a certain, uh, are a certain kind of construction. So what I would like you to see is, uh, and just think for yourself, is for uh, each one of these uh, examples that can be understood as a construction, try to put the construction in its most general footing. So what is the most general natural setting in which I can define um, new rings from old rings by means of a certain kind of construction. Okay. And an advantage of this is that it will allow you to put some kind of order in this zoo of examples. And uh, this is essential for us because uh, for us important rings are going to be rings that are going to be uh, constructed using these kinds of processes from Z and from the ring of polynomials. Uh, so having these processes clarified is going to be very useful. 